give you an update on the on the ship. And but let's start by showing you the ship. You know, I have a very three very nice three D rendering. So I hope it's going to play okay on your screen. So uh, let me start this. Hope you can see my screen correctly and see the video moving. So this is not actually a real video. This is a, a showing you a 3D lidar rendering of the of the Mayflower. So it's a big aluminium beast of uh, 15 meters, divided by three for feet or multiplied by three, sorry, and uh, by five meters uh, width. So it's a three maran, but everything is inside the middle, you know, body. And you can see right now the inside of, I mean, it's empty when I did the video, but uh, you can get a feel of how big this is inside. And um, let me, can you see the video okay, Ganesh? Very good, but uh, there is okay. no sound. There is no sound on the video. I, I, I kept the video with sound and the, the explanation for the end. So. Uh, the Mayflower has been built by uh, actually uh, uh, four foundation called Promare. Uh, so it's a, it's a non-profit project and with two missions. First, uh, uh, go in the Atlantic, Northern Atlantic, I'm very specific about this, and uh, be able to carry science experiments. So you can see on the picture, there are three open bays in the Mayflower. So I don't know if you can see my pointer, but the front bay is where you have all the electricity and AI stuff. A uh, huge bay in the middle is where the scientific experiments are. And there are nine, exp there were nine experiments on the crossing and the back bay is where the electric engines are. So it's a, it's a ship propelled by a propeller, uh, electric engines that are uh, getting their power from uh, batteries and the batteries are recharged by solar panels. So this is the kind of, you know, nice new tech, very efficient solar panel, but you can see there are not that many. So in Northern Atlantic, uh, you have to compensate the, the lack of, you know, sun uh, because the weather is typically not so nice. So there is a generator in, on board that burns a biofuel and the generator can top up the battery when they are too, too low. So you make sure you can actually uh, be a good uh, scientific ship so you can contain uh, your speed within seven to five knots and, uh, you know, go where you want and don't be, you know, pushed by the wind or pushed by the current. It's a very flat uh, ship. You can see the, the line of water on the, here on the, on the right side. Uh, the reason is that uh, it carries some hydrophones. And so you need to be quite silent if you can, uh, even if you have the noise of the generator and the noise of electric engines, but this can be filtered. And, uh, and the ship is able to suck water from under the, the hull for the scientific experiment. And the second mission, which is the one where we were, you know, very interested proposing our technology uh, in, in IBM, is they wanted to prove that they could not have a drone. They, those guys, they do drones. I mean, they do submarines for a living. Um, they wanted to have a, a cognitive uh, a set of tools on top of the, the typical drone slash robotic to be able to navigate, which means, you know, uh, navigate at sea, respecting the rules, uh, taking care of the weather, taking care of change of missions, potentially like, you know, go stay close to an accident. I mean, all those things that a normal uh, ship or a normal drone, a normal ship would do and a normal drone wouldn't do. So the company that did this is called Submergence Group. They are based in Austin, Texas. Uh, those guys, they've been doing a man and unmanned submarine, typically electric for more than 20 years. And I think it's about 25 years now. And uh, they have a, a subsidiary in the UK called MSUBS, where they actually have the license to um, to flag submarines. So you, you have to know that to homologate and flag a submarine is kind of a, a tough job, especially if it carries human. And very few companies have this uh, authorization, so MSUBS has it. And they have uh, created a company called Marine AI that on to actually host all the AI solution on top of the robotics. And uh, we, we proposed them our technologies and they were very uh, happy to test them. And uh, we were very surprised positively that they took our technology versus uh, the famous other providers. But we were not the only one in that, in that project. Uh, you can see on that page that uh, there are a bunch of companies that came to Promare and said, okay, we want to participate to that new type of ship and we we'll provide technology. So for example, the two ones that are very interesting is Thales. Uh, Thales provided the, the, the marine communication. So they provided a, a, a 358, so remember 358 kilobytes per second link by satellite. So it's a very small link that can be on and off on the ship. Uh, Garb, 
Guard is the insurer of the oil and gas in the, there in Norway. They were the first company to say, we want to insure that ship because we trust it will sail and it will be flagged, so we will insure it. So that's kind of interesting companies. In, in terms of technologies, um, uh, and I want to be clear, this is not an IBM ship, even if there is an IBM sticker on it, okay? We, our marketing um, just realized just before the, the navigation that they wanted to have an IBM sticker on the ship. So this is a ship made by uh, for Promare by MSERBs and Submergents. Uh, it is not a one-day project. Uh, it is not a startup, okay? They started on their very, very robust uh, uh, dry combat submersible or other, you know, test submersible for the navies in 2016 on this. And uh, they had a lot of challenge. And we only said to them, okay, we have two building blocks, like our systems. We have the software to do the vision, for example, and may try it and tell us. And if you want, because it's a foundation, it's a non-profit, IBM will gladly loan you the, the, the software, the hardware, so you can actually build your project because we want to be part of that neat project like this. And uh, the fun thing is they, they got the software in loan, but actually bought a power system for us to, to do the AI because the cloud was so expensive for them to pay for. And that power system now is in another project already. They are working on a, a new set of... Uh, um, digital maps for the UK hydrographic office with it. And uh, yes, just at the end, you know, IBM marketing said, oh my goodness, you know, we want a sticker. So they, they gave a little bit of money to the foundation to have a sticker, but not an IBM ship. Okay, so uh, what's interesting for you is in kind of three subjects, you know, what did we learn uh, in this project? What's happening next? And, and then a little bit about how this works internally. So uh, first, uh, you know, what happened? Uh, well, we we just uh, in IBM actually, but not for them. You know, the sea is a tough place. Things didn't work as planned. They tried to cross the ocean in 21. That's the red text, and just in the kind of west of Ireland, the exhaust pipe from the generator broke with you know the vibrations, and actually had to to stop it because uh, at that point they only had solar, which was unreliable because, unreliable because of the weather. So they actually decided to send a tow boat and uh, you know recover the uh, get the Mayflower back in uh, in the UK. So you know kind of fail a town due to um, to a mechanical failure. So they revisited the the technical uh, installation of the generator and the exhaust pipe, so it couldn't break anymore. And uh, so they restarted in 2022. This was this summer. And there are two, you know, very interesting uh, problems, which actually we were told by all the Navy people, this is great, you know, this is the proof this can work. So they had a, a circuit breaker on one of the big, uh, uh, you know, current circuits that actually melt, melted. Uh, it was due to a, a mistake by the, the electrician, comp the electric company installing the breakers. I mean, they installed a three amps, 300 amps, and actually the requirement for was for 400. So after a while, you know, it died. So they could actually tell the boat to actually divert, uh, use the, the remaining power on the other circuits and go to the air source. So they got the ship into the air source, they open it, and uh, the, it's, it's kind of funny. This is actually, I'm, I'm quoting the guy who did, when they flew to the air source, he told me, Eric, you know, it took me one screwdriver and 10 minutes to fix it. Uh, then he left. And uh, what was very interesting in the air source is actually they, had, they got the ship relaunched almost by itself with the help of one guy in the, in the harbor. So they demonstrated that this is actually a very, very easy to manage device uh, because it does, you know, very well. So then they went west and then they got into a hurricane and one of the three navigation system actually went dark and they were a little bit afraid because the waves were about 20 meters. The ship is 15 meters. Uh, it cannot recover if it's turned over. It's like a turtle. And, uh, and the plan was never to go above 10 meters wave. So what they decided is, is they decided to ask permission to Canada to stop in Halifax. So they told the ship, okay, now your mission is changed, you know, go to Halifax, you know. Uh, the ship went to Halifax. Uh, it had a very interesting, uh, funny story arriving to Halifax. Some people were so curious, they, they were racing on boats to the ship to see how the ship would behave. So the ship avoided them. So they got to Halifax, they opened it, and then uh, I, I spoke to the other guy that was coming from Austin to check the, the ship. And essentially, there was a cable that with the wave shocks on the ship and uh, the distance between the, the cable holders, the cable was moving and moving uh, onto a metal plate. And gradually, it removed the, the plastic 
then the insulation completely went out and then it got into the, the bus cables and that's what uh, took a system down. So they fixed it with tape, very simple, and two you know nylon straps and the ship went to Plymouth in the, in the US. So you see, not, um, not an easy place in the ocean and uh, they were actually very happy uh, to, to make it. Uh, and I remind you, this ship was not accompanied, it was remotely monitored when it could connect and it was deciding to handle itself, you know, based on the weather, based on the, the, the ships around him and, and et cetera. So uh, it is uh, totally autonomous. There is nobody on board. There is no man on the loop, no remote control. It's full size. It can cross, you know, oceans. It has all the sensor to understand its environment, decide what's there. The solution in the ship is actually portable. And, uh, and I will show you um, what they sell from that solution. So this is really now more than just a, you know, a first project. It's, it's becoming a, a pro it's expandable. Uh, they are talking about expanding to fleet of ships like this to have voice on board so the ship can be uh, responding to air, which it doesn't do today. And very interesting from a science point of view, uh, is this is a, a very, very cheap device. So uh, a low estimate, so very careful, is about that ship is less than one hundredth of the cost of research ships. So I don't know if you realize this, but any research ship is going to be in the range of one to two hundred millions. And this is just build it. And this is, uh, you know, very cheap research. So you can actually send that to places where if you lose it, okay, you lose just a piece of metal, you don't risk people and you don't send a scientist to see whether a scientist gets sick. So today, uh, that company, Marine AI, is providing the vision, which they develop on power uh, to clients. Uh, they provide uh, what they call manned, gu guardian man, which is uh, like an onboard, digital officer that gives you, you know, recommendation, you know, tell you what you should do, what you shouldn't do. So it's like a, an insurance uh, a company for an insurance for the, the captain and, and they call it a digital officer. Uh, they sell the full autonomy solution. So this is the Mayflower uh, uh, solution. And this is actually being, being deployed as we speak. And they have a, another option, which is to deploy it in a port or arbor. And they can, the system can actually monitor and tell you, okay, a ship somewhere is not behaving correctly. You know, it doesn't, doesn't follow a line, doesn't follow the channels, doesn't follow the rules. So they're actually in business and that's really good. So uh, the ship arrived in Plymouth, you have the picture on the top. Uh, in parallel, they've been testing on submarines and they won the award for the UK Navy for building a three months autonomy coastal surveillance submarine. So this is, you see the photo of the prototype, but the, the, the big one is being uh, being done. It's a 30 meter, I think you can find it up on Google. Uh, they have a project of a 30 meter, the bottom left one. So this one will carry two and two tons of uh, scientific equipment. And so this is actually being built as we speak. And, uh, and they are also working with uh, DARPA and CERCO and the US Navy on a 70 meter autonomous ship. That's the one on the bottom, right? So, you know, this is, we are beyond the, the prototype. Now this is happening and you know, this is being deployed to other platforms. So now uh, quickly to explain you how this works and there are kind of three things I will show you and then I'm done. First thing is uh, the ship is an edge and uh, actually uh, one of the reasons they use our technology is we have a, a very solid edge technology in IBM that was developed in 2015, has been used by military, then was made into a product. It's part of our Red Hat today in, in a kit called the cloud pack for application management essentially the concept about this and you know and they have encryption for the you know the, the radio and everything is that at the software level when you add the ship to the solution you register it and there is a unique token that's from the ship given to the control center and from the control center given to the ship and if you change the software on either side, when they reconnect, which happens, you know, regularly because they disconnect because of the weather, because of power saving, they can uniquely identify each other. So the ship knows it's talking to the real control center and the control center knows it's really going speaking to the ship. So you understand this is to avoid somebody hacking the ship, you know, faking the control center. And on the other side, uh, a fake ship talking to the control center and, you know, creating problems. So it's, it's actually a, uh, a big problem that if you have a ship at sea like this, you need to have an extremely solid security system. You need to be extremely secure. Uh, the 
is the, the, the AI. So there is a lot of, I don't know what classes you add on AI, but um, we designed the system with uh, the same approach to the Maslow pyramid. So have a look at your books and look for the Maslow pyramid. But essentially it's four layers. Bottom layer is all the robotic system. So this is where the robotics make sure the ship is always facing the waves, not to be turned over or capsized. Uh, it's maintaining minimum speed and all those basics, you know, survival things. This is robotics and this is typical robotics that you find in drones, professional or, you know, the kind of drones you can buy. And then the three top layers, this is where you have, you have uh, AI components from, uh, from our company. You have uh, components for deciding what's around you, what's your local situation and, you know, making sure you don't eat anything. There are components that are ensuring that the ship follows the rules at sea. There are rules at sea. If you navigate, you have to take a license and you know you, are, you study the coral regs and solas. So this is where you do this. So you need to know what's around you and manage your global situation. And then there is the highest level, which is knowing all this, you know, and I have a mission. So what do I do? Where do I go? And do I start my science equipment? So this is the way it is uh, operating. So let me show you into a little bit of a, a simplified but somewhat complex diagram. So on the left, you have the sensors. So there are kind of four steps. The first step is a, a step where you take all the sensors and you, we call that structure, but essentially you data fuse all the data. And so all the data that's not structured, like vision, you have to uh, run through a vision AI to actually structure it. So classify the vision. So that's why you define what's around you, like a digital map of what's around the ship. The second uh, layer is called evaluate. This is where we have a rule engine. So it's called ODM. This is an IBM product used in banking for fraud detection. So every time you pay with your credit card, you may not know it, but ODM runs 300,000 rules in two milliseconds on a big mainframe computer to check your transaction to see if it's not fraud. So the same tool, but applied to maritime rules. So that's the evaluation. So at that point for everything around the ship, for, it's a one-to-one -one evaluation for each item, each target around the ship, you define, okay, I should do this. And then the next layer, it's an optimization computation. So it's a, it's a NP complex problem that you solve there. It's done with a, a tool called um, CPLEX optimizer. It's another actually software used in logistics. Uh, it's used for optimizing routes for logistic or supply chain. And in that, in that optimization, you add the weather, you add the charts and you, you do the one too many calculation and you find what are the three best routes. That's the decision level. And then the last level is the control. That's why you, you check, you know, your best choices and you decide which one you take. And then essentially at that point, you stay, you say to the robotist, well, give me, give me that heading and give me that speed and the system does it for you. It's the robotics. Uh, and, uh, and the, the very important thing, this happens without any cloud connection. Okay. This is all in the ship on board. It doesn't need to be connected. When it's connected, you can actually collect some data and you can update, you know, the vision, you can update the rules, you can update the optimization and you can provide the ship global weather when the ship has the local weather. All right. I'm done for the Mayflower. Any question? Can they speak to me or is it a, a silent universe, Ganesh? Uh, just uh, go ahead, actually, you know, uh, they, if they want uh, any question, I mean, if they want to ask any questions, they will post it on a Q&A or a chat. Okay. Room. Please go but ahead. Don't... Very, okay. clear, very clear. You know, your, your presentation is very clear so far. Okay. Very good. So uh, what I think, I'm going to show you a little bit about AI. So you get a, a view about AI. I don't know what classes you had on AI. So Ganesh, I will assume that they didn't have many classes. Okay. And, uh, and then uh, when I'm done with this, and I'm going to spend like maybe 10 minutes on this, I'm going to put you a video on the Mayflower, which was done with a, a, a retired admiral. And it will explain you what are the use <coughs> of those things. And this is, you know, go beyond the Mayflower or the ship. Think about in terms of, you know, how you can use AI to make decisions. And that will... Uh, give you a lot of ideas. So let me sh get into another page. Just give me one second, time to share with you. So what, do you get to see something now? Yeah. Okay, so uh, the first thing I wanted to show you is this. Um, so it's a pretty complex thing, but just to level set what things are. If you look at AI, essentially 
the process is you take things that are you know from the outside universe you want to understand them you want to interpret them and then you want to decide and take action on them that's essentially what you do and uh, so on the right side typically the input is unstructured data and then you structure it this is where you have the vision national lang uh, natural language processing and this is typically where people use the terms you know analytics big data and statistical AI. So essentially you train your AI with a large amount of data. And, uh, and that's how you get, you know, models that you can use to, to make a prediction or make a classifications. And then when you've done that, you enter an area where you have structured data and you want to extract insight from that data to make decisions. And uh, so in that side, typically the, the places that play the more uh, it's symbolic AI. So it is AI trained with knowledge of human being. And this is where we use the word decision system, formal systems. And um, uh, I think that it's always good to have an example. So I'm going to switch through a deck and show you a call center example, which is something that IBM sells. I mean, it's, IBM is not only one selling, but we are pretty good at doing this. And so you understand the way this works practically. So let me share another file. Do you see the young kid picture on Ganesh? Yeah. Okay, good. So this is a, a very practical example. This is a boy. And this example was created by a friend of mine he, and he's doing AI for a living, okay? This guy has two master's degrees on AI. So he, he created that four pages for me because said, Eric, you know, you need to have something simple. So this boy is calling and he says, you know, I just bought a Glomage 360. So you, you'll get the, the reference by the number 360. It doesn't work. You know, this is crazy. And there is a lady on the other side. She says, hey, George, we're really sorry. You know, essentially, you know, we can't, we won't do anything for you. Go get reimbursed. Goodbye. And now if you look in the process of doing this, inside the human being mind, essentially, you start by understanding what George says and you, you understand it's George. He's a client. It's the first time he buys something. He bought that product. He's not happy. The product doesn't work. And, you know, kind of sentiment is like super unhappy. When you have this, you know, the, the call center lady is going to think, okay, essentially this person is so unhappy. There is a very little chance uh, they will ever buy something from us again. You know, done deal. So at that point, Typically, you know, you, you go back to what are the company policies and, you know, that company has a policy. If it's a first purchase, purchase, if the client is not a return client, don't waste time on this. And just, she says, hello, George, I'm sorry. Now, if you map this to AI, this is what you have. So you actually have a, a speech to text system that will understand the, the George language. It will, you know, translate the text to, to te uh, the speech to text. It will then you go to classifiers. So you will have natural language classifiers that will identify the name, the type, the loyalty type, you know, product, type of message, event, sentiment. You get the same thing that you get with the, the human call center lady, but you, you've done it with uh, um, statistical AI classifiers. Then you go into a stage where you want to understand. So you want to take an extract an insight from that data and the insight you extract is the probability of future sales and you can extract the same insight based on that data you know low probability of future sales and then so this can be done by a formal system or by statistical AI but when you're going to decide essentially the, the system that is used all the time is a rule system so rule-based system or symbolic AI and then somebody in the company who's, uh, you know, very apt at, uh, you know, deciding the policy has decided when the customer complains, his first con first time customer, you know, and return potential is not greater than 80%, dump it. And essentially then the system, you know, provide the answer with text to speed. And the answer is, you know, hello, George, I'm sorry, but we are not 
a very um, we're sorry that uh, the glomach uh, doesn't satisfy you entirely so essentially this is the way you you map a call center case to ai usage with those technology i was showing you and uh, and we do it uh, we do it quite uh, a lot so a lot of time when you're calling uh, a company you will not even realize you're speaking to a machine unless you start asking very specific questions because this is so common today it's been deployed by banks and many companies. Okay. Ooh, I'm just going on time. So let me go continue on the other deck. So once you have understood this, and that's, I mean, you have more or less demystified the AI and different building blocks. One thing you have to understand is that if you want to build a complex system that actually does something, it will typically in most cases, and I, I've shown you the, the Mayflower, I've just shown you just now the a call center use case, you will have to actually assemble together different kinds of AI components. So uh, typically when we were explaining the Mayflower to the first you know, people looking at it, and, and typically there were people reading magazine and they were reading like, oh, AI is black box. We were using the term this, okay, this is a, a, a symbol, um, an assembly of different technology of AI, we can explain every decision being taken due to this. And we, we are calling it a hybrid AI, uh, if you want uh, uh, assembly, to explain them that this is not what you read on magazine with like, you know, uh, kind of Halloween uh, behaviors. So, and typically one example is this, it's uh, to actually use machine learning to make predictions, to use business rules to have a decision automation, then you go into your business application and then you, you actually have an outcome. And I, I'm showing you that drawing because essentially on that page, what I'm showing you is in on the left side of my pointer, this is where you have the AI uh, components. And the right side, this is today's, your today, you know, this is the, the today application used by the company. Either it's a bank, it's a big retailer, it's whatever industry, can be an industrial client, uh, essentially, the way you, you do it is you infuse AI outcomes that are typically made of multiple AI technologies into your existing, you know, very, maybe very old business application. It can be an application that is used to build kitchens. Okay. That's simple. Um, so what can I show you that's interesting? So yeah, let's take it back a little bit to IBM. So in IBM, actually, what we try to do is exactly this. So we have a, uh, a very simple theory is uh, wherever you do your AI, is it on a laptop? Is it on an application like SaaS or MATLAB or whatever? We will provide any user the inputs into running them on the power. So it can be done with Tensor, PyTorch, you know, any kind of community runtime, any kind of tools like IBM has a very efficient machine learning tool called SnapML. You can look it up on the internet or any kind of open source mic library, or, and that's very interesting, uh, the Microsoft uh, interchange format, which is called Onyx. And we are making sure that any kind of AI can run on our systems. Uh, our systems have a specificity where we have decided to go apart and go away from the GPU, uh, too much current, uh, too complex machines. We have put uh, accelerator inside the core of the processors. And we go very fast with this. And so that means that uh, you can run all that AI on a power system and that power system, the same system that runs your existing application, you know, all your good old SAP, DB2, whatever business application and on any operating system. Uh, our power system, they can cater with AX, Unix, Linux, and all the Linuxes. So that's, that's our strategy there. And uh, Ganesh, I'm done. Uh, if there are questions, I'm happy to take them. Otherwise, you know, I will go and put the movie on the Mayflower because I'd like uh, to show them the movie. Any questions, team? Uh, if you have any questions, please, you know, go ahead and uh, put it in the yeah. Q&A box. Put, yeah, put the questions on the Slack, on the, on the text message. I can see the webinar chat and I'm going to run the video now. So watch the video. It's a very, very good video. Uh, Ray, who is an next admiral, is a really 
he, he he actually helped us in you know some of the concept when we are looking at how do we make this happen because you know it was not easy. Uh, you can ask us question. Florin was on the call helped us on, also on the Mayflower project, so he's very skilled about that project also. So let me share the video now. Thank and you. after video, I'm done. Uh, okay, give me a sec. I need to find it. Share it and restart it from the beginning. Okay. The sea is an awesomely powerful thing. There are vast areas of the ocean that we know literally nothing about. We know more about the surface of the moon than certain parts of our own planet. It was that ignorance that should scare us because the ocean controls the entire climate on our planet. This project is not about the last 400 years. It's about the next 400. It's about the future. The Mayflower autonomous ship is inspired by the 400th anniversary of the Mayflower crossing from Plymouth to Plymouth. I wasn't sure it was going to be possible. An intelligent vehicle out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. It doesn't have anybody in a control room pressing buttons or anything like that. I did 33 and a half years in the Navy. I've never seen anything like that in my life. There's no guarantee of success for any number of reasons. Will the vessel even make it across the ocean? It's the beginning of something new. Have we thought of every possible situation that it could encounter? Autonomous vessels like the Mayflower will really allow us to collect as much data as possible. What are we going to discover? What does the future hold for this type of research? This integration of autonomy and AI systems and machine learning. Once you get all these complex things working together, you can do some pretty amazing things. Mayflower Autonomous Ship Project. Based on my experience in the defense industry, I see so many applications, so much potential, not just vessels, but autonomous airplanes, land vehicles, vehicles in space. I am Ray Spicer. I lead our defense and intelligence technology team at IBM Federal. When I heard about the Mayflower Autonomous Ship Project, I immediately went to military and defense applications, particularly in a JADC2 environment or a multi-domain command and control environment. The most exciting part about Mayflower is the autonomous part. It being able to make decisions on its own without human intervention. Decisions that you can trust is a force multiplier for our military. Technology like this is necessary in today's environment. Our adversaries are employing similar technologies. We've got to outpace the threat in that regard so that we maintain a competitive edge and that we never put our sons and daughters in a fair fight. Today, I'm gonna to catch you up on the state of the project and what it really takes to make an AI captain. For me, it boils down to three main areas, object recognition, autonomous capabilities, and operating at the edge. We'll start with object recognition. We've been working on this for a, quite a long time, a number of years now. A big chunk of that time was collecting image samples. So we've got some cameras out in Plymouth Sound taking photos of things in the sea. And then people have been manually captioning those labels, say this is a boy, this is a seagull, this is a canoe. Thousands and thousands of images that we've used to train the vision system give us a model that we can download into the boat to run what we call edge processing. Ferrari has decked out the Plymouth Yacht Club with cameras and sensors that track everything as it comes and goes in the harbor. Then, the AI captain guesses what each object is and makes decisions like it would at sea. The software engineers then fact check the captain so it can learn from his mistakes. The most interesting part of this project is how the visual recognition can help the navigation to avoid collision. 
we're constantly identifying the things that we see and and that's done through recognition if you will in our brain and the same things happening inside the ship too is recognizing what is this it sees an object what kind of object is that because then it can start to make decisions about what to do to avoid that if it's a stationary object like a buoy then it can make a plan for how to navigate around the buoy knowing that that buoy is not going to change its position but if it's a moving like a ship then not only does it have to plot a course to navigate around that ship but it has to also anticipate that ship is itself also moving first recognize then build a plan and then finally executing on that Object recognition is typically a very human intensive process. I saw operators observing hour upon hour of predator video feed, looking for that one anomaly. 99% of the time there was no anomaly. So that's 99% of the time that was wasted. Today, the technology is so good, they can make that object recognition, detect the anomaly, and then alert the operator, which saves tons of time and allows operators to perform more valuable types of workloads and functions. On Mayflower, say the port side camera detects an object and that object minutes later is visible to the bow camera or the starboard side camera, it knows it's the same object. So it's not going to give you two different presentations. It's going to synchronize it. It can also synchronize it with a radar system and the automated identification system to give you more information about that particular object. So you can tell course and speed, say, on a motor vessel that's crossing in front of the Mayflower. Essentially, what the team has done is taught Mayflower to not only recognize objects, but to assess what they're doing, to analyze them, and then finally to act accordingly. It's only going to get better with time and experience, but object recognition is the easy part. The hard part is understanding what you're seeing, analyzing it, and then knowing what to do about it. And that's where the AI captain comes in. So when Mayflower is underway, she's constantly analyzing different sources of data. At the moment, we're relying on radar quite strongly. And then all that data is being augmented with the AIS. AIS is an international tracker that shows the location and planned route of almost every ship at sea. And then if something is being completely missed with both the radar, both the AIS system, then the camera vision system, the power vision comes in. Down here, we have the cameras broadcasting from six points on the Mayflower, and these would feed into the Mayflower's computer vision systems. But all this rich data is useless unless the Mayflower knows how to process it correctly. We've described the Mayflower as a hybrid AI system. It's a combination of machine learning, deep learning systems, we use deterministic rule set. We're using ODM for our Colregs engine. Colregs, or collision regulations, are international rules designed to prevent accidents at sea. They are key to navigating the ocean safely. IBM's Operational Decision Manager, or ODM, is tasked with knowing those regulations and helping the AI make the right decision. So ODM stands for Operational Decision Manager. Um, it's a different approach than machine learning. It's not learning from images. You teach it by telling it what are the rules that it needs to follow. For the Mayflower, these rules are co-regs, but alone, they aren't enough. Not everybody respects those rules. So in addition to that, we've also picked the brain of a few seasoned sea captains, people who have been at sea for decades and know what to do in each situation. One of the reasons ODM is so applicable to a project like the Mayflower is its unique ability to take a very complex logic problem, but make it very simple for a user to input a flow. ODM provides us with a tool to allow an expert in the safe operation of a vessel at sea to build this rule set that we can then deploy in the ship. We're not pretending that we have all the answers with Mayflower. It's a tool for learning. The fascinating part to me is that this ship was built to be fully autonomous. It's not remote control. There's not a human with a joystick telling it what to do. We've trained it on how to operate. A lot of what goes into the cost of building a ship is to support 
humans, a place to sleep, a place to eat. When you go to fully autonomous, all that goes away. Minimizing risk to life is huge. It gives a tactical commander so many more options. It can operate in any domain, sea, air, land, space, cyberspace, can increase dwell time, can increase coverage, can extend the reach. So you have a better situational understanding, a saturation strategy where you have hundreds, maybe thousands of these vehicles out in the environment, which further complicates the adversary's ability to target and gain their own situational understanding of the environment. But with the way our forces operate, they operate at the edge today. We need to provide technology that enables them to leverage AI, machine learning, and automation at the edge so they can make decisions at the edge. Obviously, the, the Mayflower is packed full of incredible technologies. And then for the science, we've got our custom-made science pod, which is a cluster of inexpensive computers that we've actually got our science experiments running on. Each one of those devices has a specific role to play within the data that it collects. We can then start to perform the data analysis and the compute on the ship, aka an edge device, and then we can feed that data back to the cloud for further processing. The reason it's important that we have this edge computing done on the ship is because then we can decide exactly from the ship which data we feed back to the cloud rather than just doing a huge data dump. I'm here uh, really focusing on actually trying to get some clean data from the hydrophone that's fitted to the vessel. We're hoping to detect marine mammals, but we can't do that unless we have some audio data actually from the vessel to start with. In order to figure out which sound is which, we first need to train the AI to identify what it's hearing. We've got IBM Industrial Acoustic Insights trained on hours and hours and hours of audio data to actually detect and classify different marine mammal sounds. Once the science pod records the data, it then transmits any interesting classifications over the cloud to us. If we think we've heard something really exciting like a whale, those particular classifications will be sent over and we'll be able to listen to that audio from land. There's not a human being there to flip a switch or to change something as the situation adapts. It has to be all done with software, with hardware. To me, edge computing is all about tactical advantage, competitive advantage, speed of decision making in this environment where it used to be days, weeks, hours that you needed to make a decision. Now we're talking about seconds or even milliseconds. Our forces routinely operate forward, oftentimes with limited or no connectivity at all to higher headquarters. They need the information at the edge in order to make reasonable decisions. But really, when we're talking about autonomous vehicles, it's not an operator. It is a machine making the decision based on the information available and how we trained it. That's a huge difference. It's the machine making the call. The more that we can experiment with this type of technology, the object recognition, the autonomous operations, but doing it at the edge, the more experience that the system will gain, the more trust that we humans will develop in the system itself, that it will act the way that we want it to act when forward deployed and especially when disconnected. Mayflower Autonomous Ship is a research project. It's an experiment. But we have already learned so much from the journey. The potential of this type of technology, both in the military and throughout government and other industries, is enormous. I'm excited about the fact that we're doing this level of experimentation. We're succeeding. We're learning a ton. This is a celebration of years of hard work by a lot of people, but it's just the start. Ganesh and uh, people on the call, thank you for your time. I hope you learned something, you were interested, you know, please uh, get back to Ganesh or to us if you have any questions. And again, thank you very much.